First John chapter 3, verse 1 to 8, that was uh, read in your hearing. For a few minutes this morning, we'll talk from the subject, sin from God's vantage point. Sin from God's vantage point. In 1 John 3, verse 1, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purified himself, even as he is pure. Who shall commit a sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And I want you to hold on to that thought. Yes. And you know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. And then he says here, John says, little children, yes. let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Amen. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, hold that thought, yes, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. What is our biggest problem? What is our biggest problem? Some people may say, not enough money, health not good enough, have not achieved enough fame, uh, and have not achieved a certain level of education, and have not uh, received uh, unity amongst men, or uh, have not eliminated world hunger. People may go on and on with the list, but the biggest problem that we have, Brother Dwayne, is what? Sin. Sin. The biggest problem, amen, amen, that we face is sin. And I know if you got your halo on this morning, you probably say, yeah, that's the problem y'all are dealing with, sin. <laughs> but if you want this morning, take off the halo, put it in your purse, put it in your pocket, put it on the seat beside you, pick it up on the way out. <laughs> because this morning, I want to talk about our biggest problem, and our biggest problem is sin. Amen. If not for sin, Heaven will be a shoe in. Amen. Amen. I just made that up for a camp for y'all. <laughs> shoe in means a sure winner or a sure chance. So if not for sin, heaven would be a shoe in. Amen. But because we deal with this problem called sin, I think it's important that for a few minutes this morning, I ask that you give me your undivided attention to the Word of God. You see, this message here could be one of the most important messages you will ever hear if you listen closely. I'm wondering why I ain't seen these words. And y'all know I don't put my fun on like 16 now, right? My, my, I, well, I don't have like 39 pages up here. They have about three words on it because the fun says keep getting bigger, amen? That helps out a lot. This could be one of the most important messages you will ever hear if you listen closely just a few minutes. I want to talk about sin, but more importantly, I want to talk about sin from God's vantage point. You say, preacher, what is, uh, what is meant by vantage point? Well, vantage point means that if you are sitting here and something's going on over here, and you're looking from here, that is the way you see it. And when you give your opinion about it, that's going to be your opinion from the particular position that you see it are basically your viewpoint. Let's talk about sin or look at sin from God's viewpoint or from God's vantage point. Simply put, I want us this morning to see sin, something that we may not take time to do often enough, but if we take time to see sin the way God sees sin. You see, God don't see sin 
like you would not see sin. And we don't see sin, I'm afraid, the way that God sees sin. Because I believe that if we saw sin, the way God sees sin, we wouldn't sin, amen, as much as we sin. Sometimes in the process process of coming to uh, grips with the gravity of the seriousness of a subject, we have to be willing, we have to be able to see it from the viewpoint of someone who has been witness to the power and effects of the subject at hand. And God has seen sin from every which way. Amen. Amen. God has seen sin from ways that we can never see sin, from vantage points, from viewpoints that we would never be able to see sin. So I believe that if we see sin the way God sees it, it's going to help us, amen, amen. to get to help. Sometimes we are willing to give uh, more credit to someone after they have gone through something, amen. But you don't necessarily have to go through something to be able to tell somebody about something, amen. I can put my hand on a hot stove and then I can tell you how bad it is to put your hand on a hot stove or I can just know that that's a man, mm-hmm. a bad thing to do. Man. But God has seen sin from all different angles. He's seen it from all different angles and he's seen it, it it's committed in all different ways so he can tell us about sin. God knows sin not because he has given in to sin at any time, but because he knows and has seen what it is and how it affects us. Man, man. First use of the word sin in Scripture came in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, it says, If thou doest well, and this is God talking to Cain, yeah. shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, I'm talking about the first use of the word sin. I'm not talking about the first sin, even. I'm just talking about the first use of the word sin. If thou doest not well, God tells Cain, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And we know what happened with Cain. Cain did not offer his best to God. And then he went on to murder his own brother. And God told him that if you don't do what you know to do, sin lies at the door. Amen. So what is sin? Now we understand that uh, vantage point means a position or standpoint from which something is viewed or considered, or uh, a point of view. Let's define what is sin. Sin is defined According to the Bible, it says a transgression of the law. First John chapter uh, three. Sin is defined as a transgression of the law of God, a breaking of the rules as God has set forth, or missing the mark. Now, let me show you this way: if you and I are playing a game. And the object, in order to receive a score, is to hit this dot. What happens if you throw the dart and hit here? How many points do you get? The object is to hit the dot, amen. If you throw it and hit where the X is, how many points do you get? Zero. Tell me, Brother Metal. Zero. Brother Metal's sportsman, he know. He's got 318 sports channels. It's zero. Amen. You throw it here and it, and it lands there, what do you get? Why do you get zero? Because you what? You miss the mark. Listen, that's what sin is. Sin is you miss the mark. That's what sin is. It's a transgression of the law of God. So God's law says love. But you land over here, you miss the mark. God says forgive. You hit down here and all up around here, you miss the mark. Don't y'all ever forget that. Because when we 
sin, we go through life missing the mark. Amen. You get zero when you miss the mark. Amen. A few words, and I'll be done for this morning. Y'all bear with me. A few words that are epithets are uh, characterizations for sin. When we talk about sin, uh, some of the words that we use, we use the words like transgression or treason. Listen to these words now. Transgression or treason or iniquity or perverse or crooked dealings. That which is twisted or bent out of shape. So does anything sound appealing about sin to you? No. Even the words that characterize uh, that are used to characterize sin, those words treason and iniquity and perverse, crooked dealings, twisted, bit out, those words don't even sound appealing. Mm -hmm. And they all are talking about that word sin. Mm -hmm. Sin from God's vantage point. First of all, you need to know this. God has seen the cost of sin up close and personal from his vantage point. God knows the cost of our sin. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 21 through 24, and I'm only going to read for time's sake, verse 24. Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. Excuse me, Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24 says, So he drove out the man. He drove, notice what happened here. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 24, the Bible talks about Adam and Eve and how they ate other fruit in the garden that God had forbidden them to eat. Eve even said that God said, don't even touch it. But God drove them from paradise, the garden of Eden. He drove them from that place because of sin, because of transgression, because of disobedience, he drove them out. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, the Bible says, So he drove out the man, and then watch what he did. He placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, mm -hmm. and a flaming sword which turned every which way to keep the way of the tree of life. Parents, if you want to put them wrong kids out and don't want them back in there, <laughs> either change the locks, amen, move, or get you a flaming sword and put it at that door. God chose to explain the sword. Amen. He drove them out. Why? Right? Because of sin. This is God putting his children out. Because of sin. Man. That's how God sees sin. And parents, we know it takes a lot for us to put our children out. Amen. It takes a lot, don't it? I know some of you still got 19, what, 40, 50, 60 year old kids still living at home. Some of you may be 50, 60 year old kids living at home. That's all right, though. That's between you and your parents. Because it takes a lot to put them out. Amen. Don't you know it took a lot for God to put his children out? Say, get out! Yes, sir. But from his vantage point, that's how he sees sin. From his viewpoint, he don't like sin. He put them out. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 14, you see, God knows the cost of sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Talk about God knows the cost. He knows up close and personal. From his viewpoint, he knows the cost of sin. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man, sin, what? Entered into the world. Talking about who? Talking about Adam. The same one he put out. But it didn't stop there. The pain and the hurt for God did not stop with putting Adam out of the house because he had to do something else to make a way for us back into the house. Did y'all get that? The pain, the agony that it took for him to put his son out of the house, watch what he had to do in order to be able to open the door for us to come back into the house and tell me that we see sin the way God sees sin. Because if we saw sin the way God sees sin, we wouldn't <coughs> sin as much. 
we need to make an effort to cut back with it. Amen. How much we sin. Amen. It says in Romans 5, 12, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death hath passed upon all men, for they all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. There is no law, there is no sin. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even though them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him that was to come. And then we know that Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, by his death, by his death, that's the cost of sin, amen? amen. And when we see sin from God's vantage point, we have a better understanding of how God looks at sin. And I believe, church, that, that will help us because we can't get to heaven in sin, amen. amen? We can't get to heaven in sin. So I believe this will help us to see the importance of recognizing sin for what it is and back it up saying, you know what? Be like a man called Job. He feared God and he excused. Or he avoided evil. I believe Job had that thing figured out. I believe Paul figured that thing out at a point. Because of sin, Jesus the Christ died on the cross. So God knows the consequences of sin. Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 12. They're going to read that because y'all know when I read that, I start crying. Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 12. The consequences of sin, the, excuse me, not the, the mistreatment and the ultimate death of his son on the cross. As we look at Isaiah 53, 1 through 12, I want you to, I want you to go home and read. I'm going to read that. And I'm, I'm not going to cry this morning, y'all. Because I'm, I'm, I'm about done here. Who hath delivered our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall throw up before him as a tender plant. And there's a root out of a dry ground, he had no form, no covenants. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Mm. Listen to what that says about my Lord. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And when he, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened out his mouth. He has brought us a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shoes is dumb, so open not his mouth. He was taken from prison from judgment, and who should declare his generation? But he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people, God says, was he stricken. He made his way with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. But watch this. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall pull on his days, and the plan of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify men, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, he used to divide his forward and strong because he had poured out his soul unto death. He was not with the transgress. He bare the sin, not for his sin. He bare the sin, not for anything he had done. He bare the sin, not for anything that he was accused of doing or that he committed. He bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. God sees sin from the vantage point that he had to put his creation out of the Garden of Eden. God sees sin from the vantage point or the viewpoint of his son dying on the cross of Calvary for us. 
And we need to see sin the way God sees sin. The second thing here, the consequence of sin from God's vantage point. How does God see sin or the consequence of sin from his vantage point? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Write these down. Write these down. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Sin separates us from God. He hides his face from us and does not acknowledge us. They're saying I'm hiding my face from my child and I don't even acknowledge them. Tell me what kind of they're easy for. But that's the vantage point or the viewpoint from which God sees sin. In Romans 6, 3, God sees the consequence of sin like this. For the wage of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. God sees sin as being a payday. Yes. And that payday is death for his children. That's how God sees the consequence of sin. In John 8, 21, Jesus himself said, I go my way, you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. He says, where I go, you cannot come. That's how God sees the consequences of sin. So the consequences of sin are nothing to play with, amen? Amen. It's a serious matter. The consequences of sin ain't nothing to be playing with. And as I close here, the last thing, the last vantage point, the last viewpoint, I want you to be able to see through God's eyes. I want you to see through God's eyes how disgusting. Everybody knows that word, they know it. You hear, you hear even a little young people cry, oh, that's disgusting. That's disgusting. Everybody. Understand the meaning of the word disgusting. Listen, sin in the sight of God from where he sees it, because sometimes we don't see sin as disgusting. Because we can't wait to get back into it, amen. <laughs> and if something's disgusting to us, I don't want nothing else to do. Right? Yeah, that's, that's what we would yeah, yeah. If it's disgusting, I, I, I don't want nothing else to do with that. That tastes good. I know, I don't know. Uh -uh. But we don't see sin the way God sees sin. God sees sin as disgusting. And here are a few ways that God, uh, we can describe the, the sin as God looks at it through his eyes. In Isaiah 1, 6, uh, it can be seen as a putrefying uh, disease. In Psalm uh, 38, verse 4 through 6, uh, God sees sin as a heavy burden. In Numbers 12, 1, uh, God sees us and our intermingling with sin as foolish insanity. Mm. What is insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting what? A different result. God sees sin as foolish insanity. We're foolish enough to do the same thing over, as I'm going to the back of the building, but I ain't going through the door, I'm going through that wall, so off I go run to that wall. Get up, wipe my head off, I'm still going to the back of the building through that wall. Over and over, but thank you, I'm going to end up in the back. I'm not going to end up back, I'm going to end up right on this floor, not that with paramedics, amen. I'm not trying to do CPR, amen. That's insanity. And God sees our dealings with sin as foolish insanity. That's Numbers 12 and 11. He sees it as defiling filth. I gotta read just a second. But this one is so disgusting. Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. I'm about down here. Second Peter chapter two. Uh, hey, starting at verse twenty. Second Peter two twenty. It says, "For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled." You see, sin has us captive. When we are involved in sin, we are entangled. We are captive, we are held captive by sin. And when I think about being entangled in sin, I think about somebody falling in some water. And you ever seen, uh, maybe in a movie where they fall in the water, and they'll, they'll, they'll weeds down there, those tall weeds, they kind of get, and, they, and the more they try to get out, the more they become entangled. Mm -hmm. That used to be frightening. Amen. Amen. You trap underwater entangled in weeds. But that's how we always sin, y'all. When we allow ourselves to keep giving in to sin over and over, we allow ourselves to become entangled. 
So it says they are again attained their end and overcome. But he says, watch this. When we get over that stuff, one thing about it, we can get out. Yeah. He says, and they get in it, and then they overcome. He said, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Verse 21, 2 Peter chapter 2 says, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment, deliver unto them, and then watch this and tell me this ain't disgusting. He says, But it happened unto them according to the true proverb, yeah, yeah, yeah. the dog is turned to his own vomit again. Now, some of you may not have witnessed this, but a uh, boy growing up in Pine Bluff out there in the country, See, I didn't know a pet store existed when I was little. We didn't have a pet store. We had a pet that was called something wanted to the house. And we put a rope around his neck, and that's our pet. <laughs> that's it. And he get out there in front of the car one day, because we live right there on the main road, and get hit by a car, well, pet gone. <laughs> Nobody gonna cry. Somebody else dog run up, we got another dog, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Next year we may have a cat. So I witnessed as a young boy. Dogs have eaten something, and for whatever reason, it didn't agree with their stomach, and they vomited. I thought I would say the good thing now. They vomited, and they turned and walked away, and then, like, now I thought, oh, well, I'm going to be hungry by home. And went back and ate it. Yep. Amen. I've seen dogs do that now. Yeah. Amen. It's not just something that somebody decided to throw in here. That's true. Yeah. I've seen it. Yep. They turn around and eat their own vomit. That is disgusting. But God says, once we have known the knowledge of the truth, know what he says, know what his word says, and we turn and go back into our sins, it's just like the dog going back and being his own woman. That's how God sees sin. And I know that nobody in here would do that physically. But why don't we allow ourselves to do it spiritually? Why don't we allow ourselves Spiritually, go back into that which is putrid, which is disgusting, and get back involved in it. Mm. That's how God sees sin. Mm. Let me close here. Then it says, uh, and again, the sow that was washed her while in the mouth, clean up a pig, let it go right back to the mud. That's what they do. But that's how God sees sin. As a blinding debt, Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, God sees sin as a blinding debt. In James 1, 27, he sees it as a blemishing stain. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14, as impenetrable darkness. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, as I close here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, I want you to see this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, as I close. Sin from God's vantage point will cause us to void our inheritance. Now remember that this memorial, right? I ain't picking that right. So if you go out this week, I'm giving us credit, right? So when you leave here today, before you get out of this building, when you miss the mark, hey man, I must have seen before you get out of this moment. Like, well, I am not tell the truth. But we ain't gonna do that, right? No, we're gonna see sin from God's vantage point. Amen. Amen. And if I look at sin from God's vantage point, I'm gonna think completely differently about sin before I leave here and as I leave here. I've got a lot of things to do. Oh yeah, here it is. Boys, our Somebody leaves or gives to you in the form of a gift or whatever, usually uh, upon that person's death, but not necessarily, but it's an inheritance. It's a gift. You see, God, the way He sees sin, and because of the seriousness and the gravity that He places on sin, it will cause us to lose. Our inheritance. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm glad to ask. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Know ye not 
that the unrighteous shall not what? Inherit the kingdom of God. <coughs> unrighteousness, the Bible says all unrighteousness is what? It's sin. So if all unrighteousness is sin, God don't like sin, if what I'm doing is unrighteous, then I must be involved in what? Sin. Right. But here, Paul says to the church at Corinth, don't you know, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? It will void our inheritance. Now, how many of us want our inheritance void? Zero. Zero, right. We don't want to lose our inheritance, right? We want to go to heaven. We want, I want to go to heaven. You want to go to heaven. We want to go to heaven. But if we give in to sin, we will void our inheritance. And then Paul says, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then Paul says, And such were some of you. Mm -hmm. But what happened, Paul? You are washed. You're sanctified, been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. And then he says, but if we go back to those things, after we have been delivered from those things, mm -hmm. it's just like the dog turning yes. to his vomit. That's how God sees sin. God sees sin as disgusting. And until we can see sin from God's vantage point, I'm afraid that we will not take the necessary effort mm -hmm. to avoid sin. Right. The thing about sin from God's vantage point, and I'm done here, you see, sometimes we, we look at things like, oh, that's so cute. Mm -hmm. From God's vantage point, sin is not cute. Mm -hmm. From God's vantage point, sin is not a laughing matter. From God's vantage point, sin is is not innocent. They all oh, just little innocent sin. What in the world? <laughs> innocent sin? You ask God about that. Mm -hmm. See how innocent it is. See, God doesn't look at sin like we look at sin. See, to God, sin is not based on what the crowd is doing. God don't care what the crowd is doing. If it's sin, it's sin. What is popular or trending? God doesn't care. Sin is what? Sin. Well, what if it benefits me? Sin is sin. What if it feels good? Amen. Some of y'all were part of that back in the, uh, what was it, the 60s, that movement? I was born in 64, so you know I was back there trying to feel like nothing, amen. Some of y'all, old enough to remember, if it feels good, do it. Do it. It may feel good, and you may choose to do it. But how does God see it? It's very important that we understand how God sees sin from his vantage point. God sees sin from the cost of sin. God looks at the consequences of sin, and then God looks at just how totally disgusting sin is, and he sees all of that about sin from his vantage point, and we do, we also need to do the same thing. Because to God, sin is rebellion. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is perversity. And sin is failure. And I'm going to leave with this. I'm going to leave with this. Because you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember this. Sin is failure. Brother Bishop, you can't tell people they fell. Sin is failure. Because when I sin, I have failed. Is that going to help somebody? I believe it is. I believe it is. To know that when I sin, every time I sin, I have failed. Because I have what? 
Enough end of the lesson. If you're here this morning, if you're not a child of God, you ought to become one. Amen. I've been obedient to the gospel of Christ. See, Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. So God knows the cost of our sin. It cost him his son. If his son paid a debt we could not pay, he paid a debt he did not owe. He died on the cross of Calvary. They took him off that cross. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. But thanks be to God, on the third day he got up. And as Brother Metal sung earlier, laid that song, Jesus rose with all power in his hand. What power? He had the power to save us from our sin. And he told the disciples, you go and tell this story about my death, my burial, and my rising up, my resurrection. He says that they willing to believe that. Hebrews 11, 6 says, so without faith, it was impossible to believe. They have to believe it. They must have a change of mind. It's called repentance. Luke 13, 3 and 5, he says, I tell you, but except you repent, you will perish. They must be willing to confess after having a change of heart. They must be willing to confess. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, he said, confess me before men. I confess you before my Father which is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I deny you before my Father which is in heaven. Yeah, yeah. And then, after making that noble confession, and I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the same one you made in Acts mm -hmm. chapter 8, you must be willing to be baptized in water for remission of sins, have all your sins washed away, saying, He that believes in him baptized shall be saved. Acts 2 30 said, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then you come up to walk in newness of life, and the Lord adds you to his church, and now a member of his family. And then, Sam, we have to be faithful. Revelation 2.10 says, be thy faithful unto death. For a lot of times, we get to the baptism part, and we say, hey, I'm saved, and right back to the moment we go. Yeah. But you have to be faithful. Amen. Amen. Be thy faithful unto death, he says in Revelation 2.10. I will give you a crown of life. Don't you want a crown of life this morning? Amen. If you're here this morning, you're not a child of God, you want a crown of life, we want you to come this morning. If you're here this morning, you're not a member of the Church of Christ, you're not a member of the Church of Christ, you want your crown this morning, we want you to have your crown this morning. But you're going to have to be obedient to the gospel and then be faithful unto death. And if you're here this morning, you're a child of God, and your crown is in jeopardy, you're about to void out your inheritance for whatever reason. You need prayer for yourself or someone else. You want to get your inheritance back right, back in order. We want you to come forward. Acknowledge whatever you need to acknowledge. If you're a member of the church, whether you need to ask for prayer for yourself or someone else, I just want to take time to thank God. We want you to come as we stand and sing this song.